The first time I played this game, I had an immense amount of fun, and I had to pry myself away from it before my ass fused to my chair. The second time I played it, it gave my computer the blue screen of death. <laughs> Forza Horizon 3 is an action role-playing game that centers around Alloy, a hunter living in- Ah oh, shit, wait, that's Horizon Zero Dawn. Forza Horizon 3 is the third game in the Forza Horizon series of open-world racing games produced by Microsoft and Turn 10 Studios, and was released in September 2016 to widespread critical acclaim. If Forza Horizon were a family, Horizon 1 would be the oldest brother who became a dentist and retired with a BMW 5 Series and a family dog. Horizon 3 would be the youngest brother who became a famous YouTube vlogger and retired at age 26. And Horizon 2 is the ugly, awkward middle child who could never live up to either sibling. Kinda like a Charmeleon. By now you're probably wondering, what's so good about the game? How many cars are there? Is that the real Australia, or is it just a Hollywood soundstage? Well, I'd be able to answer all of those questions and more if the game could run for more than 15 minutes without crashing mid-race like a marathon runner who accidentally drank scissorp instead of water. Seriously, in the first couple months of this game being out, there were all sorts of problems with the PC and Xbox One ports, and while most of the problems were fixed, like soft locking during saving, DLC not showing up in game, and the game just straight up refusing to run at all, PC players are still dealing with some of the problems that have been around since launch. Starting this game and getting it to run smoothly is like playing Russian Roulette with an assault rifle. And sometimes my car even outruns the world and patches of the ground disappear faster than the development of a shopping mall parking structure. If you see freezing and a choppy frame rate, that's not the video buffering. That's my actual game struggling to run. It stutters more than Porky Pig using a set of turntables. By now, it probably sounds like I hate this game, but that's far from the truth. This is probably one of my favorite racing games, and maybe even one of my favorite games of all time. And when it does actually run smoothly, you'll see that this game is filled to the brim with enough features and content to warrant hundreds of hours of gameplay. Speaking of which... Forza Event Horizon takes place in an alternate timeline where everything in Australia isn't trying to kill you. The game starts with a surprisingly slow downhill blast where you're in a buggy and you're racing against a jeep that's being carried by a helicopter. After you win the race, you're given a selection of four cars to keep as your first car. Obviously, I chose this wide-body Nissan S15 Silvia with a cherry blossom livery because... Now, it's time to pick your first festival location. Every time you drive to a festival location to open or expand it, you're given a selection of free or discounted cars to choose from, in the same way every awkward freshman lines up to ask the hot cheerleader girl to homecoming, except you're the hot cheerleader this time and you get to decide which one you want to ride around with until you're bored of it. There are four festival locations to choose from, each of them nestled in a different, cozy location of Charles Darwin's evolutionary extravaganza. You have Surfer's Paradise, which is pretty much Australian Laguna Beach. Byron Bay, which is like Surfer's Paradise, except you actually get to drive on the beach. Yarra Valley, which is a forested area in the Australian heartland. And the Outback, which is objectively the best area in the entire game. Each festival location has a garage, an auto show, and an auction house. The garage is where you upgrade your cars and download Red Bull and Martini paint jobs. The auto show is where you can buy cars that aren't Porsches. And the auction house is a desolate wasteland where you can buy somebody else's pre-ruined car, sometimes for more than it costs at the auto show. One cool update to the upgrade system is the basket feature. Every upgrade you select is added to a basket, and once you're ready to buy your upgrades, you can see exactly how overpowered your car will be, and how many Australian dollar redos it'll cost. It's definitely better than the previous system of buying each upgrade individually, and praying to Enzo Ferrari, Felix Wankel, and Bunta Fujiwara that your 800 horsepower twin turbo Civic will be good enough to outrace a stock Lamborghini. In addition to standard upgrades like air filters, clutches, and weight reduction, some cars come with wide body kits that you can staple onto your car, and they usually throw in a power upgrade to match it. But unlike real life, the Instagram cars that you build are actually functional. While upgrading and tuning your car is fun, the opponent's cars will always be based around the rank of your car. For example, if you take a low-ranked BMW M3 and upgrade it to, say, mid-A class, every opponent will be within about 10 performance index points of your car. This is fun because it means you can upgrade your car with almost no repercussions, but it also sucks because there's no challenge to tuning your car to meet a certain performance benchmark. 
Don't get me wrong, it is fun seeing a fully upgraded Acura Integra racing alongside supercars, but there's no challenge to it. The garage is also where you can customize your license plate with up to 8 family friendly characters and choose your horn. Unfortunately, you have to pay 3 real life dollar dues to unlock all the horns, which is just fucking stupid no matter which way you spin it. The design editor has remained pretty much unchanged. Put some colored shapes on your car, look at the design storefront and wonder how someone can make such an intricate design with colored shapes, stick said colored shapes in Vegemite and eat your sorrows away, the usual. The auto show features over 350 cars from hella brands including Nissan, Ford, BMW, not Porsche, Ferrari, etc. The selection also includes most of the cars from Initial D, and I was even able to recreate both of my real world cars in the game. But there's no Mazda AutoZam, so this game gets a 2 out of 10. Next. Ever since the first game, Forza Bring Me the Horizon has been the arcadey spin-off of the mainline motorsport series of racing sims, and the handling model reflects that. Cars somehow feel light and dense at the same time, like a rain cloud sitting on three-piece wheels or a bamboo cage filled with cocaine bricks. Basically, most of the cars feel lighter and nimbler than they would in an actual racing sim, but each collision reminds you that weight exists. Speaking of rain clouds, the rain physics add a whole new dimension of challenge to a race. Spinning out is easier and keeping grip is much harder, and depending on the handling characteristics of your car, if you can get a good launch from a standstill on wet tarmac, you deserve a medal. But once you figure out how to change your driving to deal with the rain, it's really not that hard. Driving a lowered sports car through water and dirt feels just as bad as it should, and that's definitely a good thing. If you can win an off-road race in a wide-body Subaru BRZ, you deserve, like, four medals. Drifting feels equal parts challenging and rewarding, and there are drift zones scattered all across Australia. Some of them are long, wide curves that make it easy to keep a good drift and earn lots of points, and some of them look like somebody threw a wet spaghetti noodle at a wall, turned the curvature into a road, and stuck it on the end of a three-way junction. You're also able to alter the difficulty settings that affect how your car operates, like assisted braking, damage simulation, and opponent difficulty, all of which determine how many extra credits you earn during a race. And with every Forza game, the rewind feature is still there. Every car handles differently, as they should, but if you happen to be driving a Nissan R34 Skyline, you basically win. A fully upgraded Skyline will outclass just about every other car in a circuit race, and it's pretty much an ICBM on wheels. However, if you don't feel like being cheap, my two other favorite cars are the Mazda RX-7 and the Lotus Exige. If you fully upgrade the turbo rotary engine and make Felix Michael proud, the RX-7 can be a fun, nicely handling car that drifts like a dream and has a turbo that makes the rear wheels try to marry the front ones when it kicks in. This amounts to an experience that's equal parts fun and dangerous, like your first college party, or your girlfriend walking into the room with a grapefruit saying that she wants to try something new. The Lotus Exige is a small coupe that sticks to the road and proves that horsepower isn't the key to winning a race. Do some weight reduction and throw some race tires on it, and you've got a car that will go in any direction you tell it to. Since most of the map is either dirt, desert, or any combination of those two, the selection of off-road vehicles is greatly expanded from the previous game, and it now includes dune buggies, off-road trucks, and rally cars. But if none of the specially made off-road vehicles tickle your fancy, don't let that stop you. Want to turn your unassuming Subaru Legacy into a Group B rally monster? Rally tires, weight reduction, and a metric shit ton of headlights will definitely help you with that. Actually, that leads me to my next point. You can do just about anything in this game. If you see a race event and think to yourself, you know, this is definitely not crazy enough, then you can edit the race options to whatever you want them to be, you picky little bastard. I bet you like soy milk in your coffee, don't you? You can change the time of day, the amount of laps, the car brands or types that are allowed to race, and even the song you want to play during the race. Want to have a race with only Japanese cars, Initial D style? Want to have a 3 mile migration of Reliant Robins? Want to blast through the desert in a bunch of warthogs while listening to the Halo theme? Oh yeah, I forgot to mention, the Halo theme song is in the game and you can drive a fucking warthog. What else could you possibly need? Whether it's altering a pre-existing race or setting up a custom bucket list challenge all your own, the possibilities are almost endless. But sometimes you can't do what you want, which is a poor segue into talking about showcase events. Showcase events are races where you're given a certain car and you race against things that aren't cars, like trains or fighter jets. Yeah, fucking fighter jets. 
Completing showcase events earns you a ton of followers, which serves as a deep commentary on our society and the fact that you need to do crazier and more dangerous things just to remain in the fleeting spotlight of people that you'll never know. Street races are back, and I'd say they're just about as fun as Horizon 1 street races. You unlock street races by challenging other drivers to head-to-head -to -head races, and after completing enough of them, you unlock Midnight Battles, where you race another street racer for pink slips. If you win, then you get their car, but if you lose, you're forced to hide out in your dad's Jetta until their family crime syndicate motorcycle gang finds you and guns you down in front of your own home. There are also online adventure and co-op campaign modes, but they're lackluster at best. Online adventure is just 16 player free roam where everybody only wants to play games of infected at the airstrip, and co-op campaign is more dry and desolate than your girlfriend after you shoot down her grapefruit idea. Funnily enough, the Horizon series has the exact same series-wide overarching plotline as EA's Skate series. In the first installment of both games, you start as a nobody and work your way up to the top, and then you start all over in the second game, and then you become the boss and rely more on sales and fans than money by the third game. Interesting. Anyway, you start the game with only one card to your name, and you level up and earn credits through winning races, gaining fans, and destroying as much scenery as possible. Completing races earns you credits and experience points, and after every 20,000 points, you level up and earn a wheel spin. Wheel spins give you more credits and usually a new car, but unlike the real lottery, the spinner sometimes shows you what a friend won previously. Also unlike the real lottery, you can't track your friends down and rob them of their riches. There's also the Forzathon, which is a set of challenges that you can complete to unlock credits, experience, wheel spins, or exclusive cars. This is where you unlock the Porsches if you don't feel like buying them with real-life dollary dues. Gaining fans allows you to unlock showcase events and expand your... <clears throat> ...horizons... ...to convert even more of Australia into a cement playground. Performing skills like jumping, drifting, and near misses earn you skill points, with each skill you perform being added to your skill chain. The more skills you perform, the more your score is multiplied, and the more points you can earn. Every once in a while, the DJs on any radio station will designate the next song as a skill song, which doubles all of the skill points earned while the song is playing. And if you keep a combo going during the end of a skill song, you get to keep the multiplier, which makes it hella easy to achieve over a million points from a combo. However, if you crash into something or stray too far from the bounds of a race, you'll lose your combo. It's a good risk versus reward system that makes you feel accomplished every time you bank a huge combo. Honestly, with the amount of credits, skill points, and experience this game gives you, it's almost too easy to level up quickly. But the hit detection is kinda wonky, so I guess that evens it out. Sometimes I'll have a combo and I'll accidentally forget that this isn't bumper cars at the Mullet County Fair, but the game will forgive me and I can keep my combo. But there are also times where you accidentally bump atoms between your car and a wall, and suddenly your 200,000 point combo is gone faster than you can say, the introduction of rabbits into Australia was an inside job. The soundtrack in this game is actually pretty amazing. There are 8 different radio stations spanning multiple genres including pop, rock, drum and bass, even classical music. This leads to a soundtrack consisting of a large number of songs that I really don't feel like counting. And if none of that music gets you pumped for racing, you can create a groove music playlist and listen to that in-game. Naturally, when I discovered this feature, I just had to make a super Eurobeat playlist, hop into my custom Thought Patrol Toyota Sprinter, and blast through the forest until I rev my engine to 13,000 and blow it. Anyway, what I'm trying to say is that being able to play custom music with mixing and tunnel effects in-game is a really cool feature. When it works. Once I figured out how to use it, Groove Music actually worked for a few months for me, and then out of nowhere, it started fucking up. Songs would start about 30 seconds after they were displayed, and even if they did work, sometimes they would freeze mid-song. And sometimes I even got a no playlist detected error, even though I absolutely had my Super Eurobeat playlist selected and ready to play. But I mean, Microsoft taking something wonderful and totally fucking it up? They would never. Remember when I said earlier that this game was filled to the brim with content? Well, a good amount of that is DLC. There are three versions of Horizon 3 that were released, Standard, Deluxe, and Ultimate. Standard is what you buy if you're poor. Deluxe is the standard poor edition, but it comes with VIP and a car pack, 
which kind of makes it like a used Mercedes in the sense that it makes you look rich until somebody asks you what you do for a living and you make the mistake of answering honestly. And Ultimate is just Deluxe Edition with a 6 month card pass thrown in. As of the making of this video, there are 9 DLC car packs that cost 7 freedom dollars and contain 7 cars each, and when you do the math, that adds up to a gazillion dollar bill. Wow. There were also two expansion packs that came with a few cars of their own, which brings the total amount of DLC cars to at least 12. The first of these expansions was Blizzard Mountain, a snow-covered mountain where streetcars fear to tread, and Hot Wheels, which is basically the closest you can get to driving on your childhood Hot Wheels tracks. Both of these cost $20 on release, with a bundle being released later that knocked $10 off the total price. Basically, if you bought each DLC individually, including the expansions and all the car packs, you got shafted. Lucky for me, both of the expansions were free for like, two days, which means I get to talk about them! The Hot Wheels expansion pack is genuinely one of the best parts of the game. It takes place on an island somewhere off the coast of Australia, and since I don't know exactly which island it is, let's just assume that it's New Zealand. There are seven islands in the archipelago of New Zealand that are all connected by the most impressive highway system ever, but there's only one festival site out of all of them, and it's on one island. Which is stupid. Progression in this DLC is completed through earning medals. Each race rewards one medal for completion, with two extra medals rewarded for doing cool shit during a race, like earning a certain amount of skill points or completing a lap faster than humanly possible. Most races include stunts like loops, crossroads, and ramps, and some races include the new stunt swap system, which allows you to swap out some stunts for other ones. I always swap out the wave and the crossroads for other stunts because they kill speed and they're hard to drive on and they just fucking suck. In the spirit of every Forza game before this one, races start off in lower ranks, with higher ranking races being unlocked over time. This means that you have to actually... <gasps> tune your car? But half of the races are recycled and reversed for higher ranks, which just sucks ass. Just like the original campaign, after completing enough races and earning enough medals, the final race is a Goliath race, and it took me over an hour to complete this 7 minute race because I was too busy falling off the track or having my game crash, sometimes both of them at the same time. In addition to more barn finds, there are also a few extra cars thrown in for free, so let's talk about them. The Twin Mill has two engines, 1400 horsepower, and is still slower than free economy shipping from Amazon. The Riprod is counted as a buggy, which is kind of ironic because it doesn't handle well on any surface type. Next is the Bone Shaker. You know how there's secretly a skeleton living inside of you? Well with this car, you get to be inside the skeleton. And it's badass. I haven't driven the Hot Wheels Mustang and probably never will, and the Pagani Zonda R looks like an insect that can fly at over 200 miles per hour. Alright, now let's talk about Blizzard Mountain, I guess. I need your love. On fire. Blizzard Mountain is about as much fun as a wet firework. Okay, fine, I'll talk about it for real. Blizzard Mountain takes place on a mountain, but not just any mountain, Blizzard Mountain. The first thing you do in this DLC is blast down a mountain in a rally car and hit a big ass jump, which is honestly pretty cool. And after you do that, you arrive at the festival site and the progression is exactly the same as the Hot Wheels pack, except you unlock snowflakes instead of metals. Rally tires are replaced with snow tires, and any car that you have equipped with rally tires in the base game automatically gets swapped with snow tires, which is a pretty cool feature as it actually does help you keep grip in the snow. This expansion looks really vertical since, you know, it takes place on a mountain, which makes the map look a lot smaller than it actually is. And much like Bill's car accidents and home invasions, blizzards appear randomly and they will destroy you. Visibility is much worse and you need to know the track like the back of your hand if you want any chance of surviving in one of them. Honestly, there isn't really much to say about this DLC at all. It just felt kind of boring to me. I feel like if it were a color, it would be beige. Imagine that, beige colored snow. In conclusion, if Forza Horizon the threequel were a car, I think it would be a Nissan 240SX. Sure, it looks and sounds sleek, it's really fun to be around, and it took thousands of man hours to build, but the check engine light comes on every time you look at it the wrong way, and it will absolutely break every time you try to drive it.